Welcome to Insights and Sound, where we talk to the people behind the scenes, behind the technology, and behind the music. People you may not know, but you should. My guest is Carrie Kyes. She is yes, the co-founder yay. of, of uh, she's the co-founder of Sound Girls and also a longtime monitor engineer and been involved in almost every aspect of live sound for a long, long time. And yet she's still relatively sane. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> what did somebody say to me the other day? You've got most of your marbles. Yeah, most of them. <laughs> our, our front of house engineer, Greg Nelson, he, uh, I'll, I, like a couple of years ago, I said, I go, well, I go, that hurt my feelings. He goes, you mean your one feeling that's left. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, and he was, he was referring to it as from doing monitors that I had, it just, you can't have feelings. <laughs> well, you, you just gotta, you gotta have a really, really thick skin and, yeah. and just an incredible buffer zone. Yeah, it's true. It's true. Well, let's, let's just start with a little bit of that because your background is really interesting. And I think, you know, that, might also sort of shed some light into how you've ended up where you are now in terms of what you do. Um, you kind of fell into the industry at a very young and tender age in a very um, unkind or shall we say unforgiving situation, didn't you? Yeah, I don't, I don't, yeah. I don't know if it was unforgiving because, because of the, the scale of shows we were doing were not, I, I, I mean, not to discredit doing punk rock shows in LA, but it was not the end of the world. It was not, you know, rock and roll hall of fame fail. <laughs> well, on the other hand, it's kind of cool because, you know, you start small and you start where, what do they say? Start ugly, you know? Start ugly. I, yeah. I mean, I always tell people, I'm like, go do a warp tour or a South American stadium tour. And if you still want to tour, then yeah you're in <laughs> well it, you know i mean i i i started out playing gigs at places like the mabuhai gardens you know right. um, you remember al's bar in downtown yeah. la you know and yeah. these you know they're dives and yeah. you know the good news about that is if you screw up so you just get back up and try it again right yeah yeah you know but i mean so- you're your, your your profile grew pretty quickly i think you know you because you got tossed in the deep end yeah, I mean, it was, I, it was, it was definitely a different time, um, and not being, you know, immersed in a local music scene on a daily basis anymore. I, I don't know what it's like at this point, but I mean, we had a really tight community and everybody just did what they needed to do to do shows. Um, and we were young. And, you know, there wasn't, you know, there was not a, should I do this? Uh, or um, if I do it and I do it wrong and fail, I'm not, you know, I wasn't going to lose a house or a car. I didn't have a car, <laughs> um, you know, so, you know, I think I didn't have student debt. There were, there were no sound schools. <laughs> That's the other thing. You know? Yeah. I mean, we all um, learned by, by, by doing, basically. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I ended up going to, because my parents, you know, they were very big on, you should go get some training if this is what you want to do. So there was one, uh, it was, God, what was it called? Um, I don't even remember, but it, it was a recording studio on Magnolia. It was either on Magnolia or Burbank Boulevard in Burbank. Uh-huh. Oh, it was Sound Masters. Oh, wow. They, okay. Yeah. yeah. And they they did studio work, and then they had developed this program. So, And that was the only thing out there. So I enrolled in that, sat through, you know, four, four recording session instructions and then by the time we got to the live sound which was only six weeks um i dropped out because i went on tour <laughs> so. well and i think that's that's kind of interesting because you know for for a lot of us that's really what it was is just that 
it was so much easier to just get in and do it and dive in on the deep end. And, you know, I mean, as you say, you know, you, you don't have that much to lose. And also, I think at that age, we're kind of, you know, we're not indestructible, but we think we are. Yeah, for you know? sure. For sure. And so, you know, the idea of doing 20 hour days and things like uh, that. I mean, it was much easier. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's an easy week, right? Yeah. Yeah. So how did things, how did things grow for you? Did you just, I mean, was it about your network? Because that's, you know, that's one of the things I tell a lot of younger people now about, you know, building your network and everything. Right. Um, yeah, for, for sure. I mean, I, I was lucky in the respect that I just said, this is what I'm going to do. Um, and, you know, I started, I, I had met Dave Rat, started at Rat Sound. Um, and they and Rat was so small at that point. One one system fit in a 16-foot bobtail, and the other system sit, uh, fit in a cargo van. That was it. There was two people, um, and Dave and Brian would either work shows together, or if they had two shows on the same day, they would hire someone else, and I just fell in and did all the shows with Dave. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, that could range from actually being paid to not being paid. Um, <laughs> but again, I was, you know, 17 or 18 and had nothing to lose. So, um, you know, so we just, you know, we worked, did every show that came through and I learned on the job, mm -hmm. you know, and yeah, so you, you know, I guess our mainstay was probably, you know, with Golden Voice and doing a lot of the punk rock shows sure. through so Southern California. Um, but, you know, we did, uh, you know, all er everything for show for uh, in a mall for the next up and coming teen singer to, you know, a gospel fest or, you know, whatever it was. Um, and so it being able to work all the shows mm -hmm. you just so much experience mm -hmm. so how'd you fall into monitors because that's a, that's kind of a that's a dangerous territory in a lot of ways it, it was just kind of since there was only two of us me and dave and occasionally a lighting person that would help me uh-huh everybody we did everything that needed to be done so we'd get the pa loaded in and then he'd go to front of house and I would work stage. Ah. And sometimes what was left basically, right? Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes there sometimes we had a monitor mix. I mean, this was back in the day that you could hire a system for 400 bucks and do monitors off the main board, right? Uh -huh. So, um I just, that was my, that's where I learned, that's where I stayed. And by the time most people leave to front of house, because most of them try to, at least, it was kind of, it was kind of too late. Um, that was where I felt comfortable. Um, I was good at it. Um, and then, but, and then, you know, six years after that and started touring as monitor engineer. So it wasn't ever like, there was never, not ever really a time of like, okay, I'm moving to front of house now. Well, it also speaks to your rapport with, with the artists, because I think, you know, it does take a different type of rapport to be mixing monitors than it does to be mixing front of house yeah. or a lot of other gigs. Yeah. And um, you know, I mean, your ability to communicate with the artists, I think. Yeah, and you you know, it's like it was, um, you know, part of doing monitors is being able to uh, remain calm and keep people calm on stage, <laughs> and that they feel that they don't have to worry about it. You know, mm -hmm. that I'm not going to look at them with deer and headlights look in the middle of the show, going, don't know, um, you know, so. That's part of it, and I, you know, and I think think front of house just is has it takes a different type of personality, um, and you got to really have like monitors. You got to strip your ego away, 
because it's not about you. It's not about your mix. It's about whatever those people on stage need that day, right? Yeah. In front of the house, you, you just kind of need an ego because you're putting out everything to everyone and to management and wives and husbands and everybody has an opinion, right? Well, as a, a, f- a friend of mine who's been doing front of house for years once put it, you know, I'm, I'm out there and I'm playing with a huge stereo, you know, and people either like what I'm doing or not, you know. Right, right. But, but your, your communication is, as you say, it's completely different. It's with the artist. Yeah. And yeah. that's, no, I mean, you know, of course, we're, we're going we're gonna to get into some gender issues here because you were one of the, you were among the sea of, um, a sea of men. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, probably your attitude really helped you survive that, no doubt. But, um, you know, was it was it more of a hindrance or was it irrelevant to you? I mean. Um, yeah, I'd, I yeah, it's interesting because I go round and round with this because to me at this point, in 2021 for some reason it seems harder for women to get their foot in the door than it did in 1986 um and i think part of that at least in our industry is still in 1986 it was still the wild west yeah yeah um you know every sound company had their own system that they had designed and built there was no L acoustics or DMB that you could just, if you had a pile of money, you could order a PA and it would probably sound pretty good. I know it was all piece right together systems and boxes yeah. and amps from God knows yeah. where. And- you know, even like the earliest stages of like, you know, like the EAW 850 systems, they were supposed to be consistent oh, everywhere you went. And <laughs> it's still. You know, it was up to how the sound company had configured it. Mm-hmm. So you could get one one day and it was gr- the greatest thing in the world. And the next day it was just a pile of broken nightmare. Yep. yep. Um, so since it was the Wild West, it, I think it was just easier because everybody was trying to figure out what they were doing, learning their job without training putting on shows and it was, it came down to is if you had a good attitude and if you could do the work. And as long as that, there there wasn't an issue. And I think that's, you know, it's interesting because, you know, I, I love and applaud and have always supported what you do with sound girls. And at the same time, I think it's, it's a damn shame that we need this it's because super, it's super yeah. frustrating. And, and, uh, you know, I mean, to me, I, in certain ways, it almost breaks my heart when I hear some of these stories and I hear, you know, I, I read stuff online for, of women who are saying, screw this. I'm only going to work with other women because, yeah. you know, and, and of course that just contributes to the separatism even more. Uh, yeah. And yeah. it's, you know, it, it's, it's a shame. And at the same time, I mean, it's wonderful that we have this support network now and that you guys are, are able to do this. But, you know, I think one of the things that probably was really helpful for you was the idea that my genitalia has nothing to do with what I'm doing at work. Right. You know, I mean, unless you're flea, you know, you're not wearing your genitalia on your sleeve, right. so, you know, yeah, exactly. and, and it's like, you know, I'm, I want to hire somebody because they're good at what they do, not because they're a woman or because they're not a woman. Right. right. I mean, you had that advantage and in a sense, you know, it's, it's it, it would be great if we could all live in that Pollyanna kind of world. Right. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Unfortunately, we, can't and i you know this is what year seven of sound girls uh-huh. um and we i i still don't have an answer um getting harder or easier of getting in for women i i think in that i don't i don't know because you know we hear from women that don't have any issues. We hear from women that just can't even get a break. 
um, and it's not just when it's it's you know underrepresented groups you know yeah. uh, occasionally yeah. i'll get emails of you know i've changed my name on my for my resumes to a white sounding name sure sure so it doesn't get thrown in the dumpster right away the same and way a lot of women use their initials or you know use their use initials so you can't tell yeah. right off the bat so but you know that may, it's super sad because you know if you're if people that are in hiring positions aren't and uh, you know and this is tricky because i used to do hiring so i know being flooded with 200 coming in on monday and having 200 resumes sitting <laughs> on your desk and you're just yep. like we're not even hiring right now yeah um but to if you're in that position you've got to look through those resumes yeah um and yeah, there's going to be a lot that get thrown in the dumpster because they're applying for something that you're not even hiring for. You know, like I, I was going too. through live sound stuff and I'm getting applications from recording engineers. And I'm like, yep, no, <laughs> we need to EQ the kick drum in 30 seconds. <laughs> you know, we don't have all um, afternoon for a snare sound. Yeah. Yeah. But you got to take the time and look through those because there's just so many people being overlooked and so much talent wasted by not getting a shot at it. Yeah. I think there's mm-hmm. also, you know, one of the things that I've, I have seen a lot of, especially doing a lot of the panels at NAM and a lot of these other shows is mm-hmm. that there's a lack of awareness of certain jobs out there. I mean, you know, a lot of times I'll, I'll do like, you know, I did a panel on sound design, for example, you know, and people came up to me, young students came up to me after the panel and said, I had no idea this kind of work even existed. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I think there's a lot of that. And yeah, I think our industry has to do better through at least through the educational systems of putting this information out there because I mean, everybody kind of, they fall into what they're, they gravitate towards, but if they're not exposed to it, yeah. They, and they don't know it exists. They're not, it's, it's just, yeah. Yeah. And a lot of it, like you say, I mean, it, it's the glamour jobs, you know, it's like they yeah. see the monitor engineer, they see the front of house person, yeah. you know, and there's all this other stuff behind the scenes. There's all yeah. this technical work. And especially now with so much of it being, you know, almost IT based. Yeah. I mean, yeah, being super up on IT, which I'm not, um, and RF, those are hugely high, you know, no, you're not mixing, but, you know, sometimes mixing is overrated, you know, like people are like, well, what, what would you like to, and I'm like, I would just like to patch stage and do it correctly, <laughs> you know, because yeah. like, just, there's just a lot of pressure off on, like, I know I can patch the stage and I can keep track of hundreds of inputs for everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is highly stressful. And I always say it's the most important job because if your stage patch is screwed up, your show's screwed up. And then you're going to have <laughs> a front of house person really, really pissed off at you. <laughs> yeah. And a monitor engineer in tears. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, you know, but there, but it does take, it, there's a different, it's a different pressure. It's not. It's not the pressure of blowing a show for a band, you know, in front of 75,000 people. Um, yeah. Well, you know, I, I and, and again, you know, not to not to denigrate the the issue that a lot of women face. But I think, you know, some of this now really is, as you say, it's people of color. It's even, you know even young white guys, you know, I mean, yeah. a lot of people, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's amazing to me, the me too stories that you hear about everybody being yeah. discriminated against. And yeah. I think that's, you know, that's something that there's room for improvement in, you know, in our industry and in society in general. Yeah, but, I, I agree. You know, I, I think um, I love what you guys are doing and I hope that, you know, well, let me ask you because you're involved in this every day. What can, what can people in our industry do to, to support these kind well, of efforts? 
the I think probably the the number one thing is if you are in a hiring position, whether you're directly responsible for hiring um, or are around people and can suggest people is, you know, uh, making sure that you include an interview. I, I don't know, pick one woman to interview for the job. Mm -hmm. It would be great if you could pick three or four. Um, same with, you know, people of color and include them in your interview process. Um, and if people don't know where to find those people to, you know, there's plenty of organizations now that they can reach out to. And most of them have some type of directory that they can go through and find people or, you know, they all have Facebook groups and post jobs and internships, mm -hmm. send them your job description and have people apply. Um, and if you're just asking for references, because that's how most of the industry hires. So I get a call to do something. I'm like, yeah, I'm not available, but here are three other people. No. Um, start including women and people of color in that, in your recommendations, if you can, mm -hmm. you know. Now, let me ask you, because this is something that is endemic in our industry, whether it's the recording side or whether it's the live side, the industry has changed a whole lot. Mm -hmm. And the nature of what we do and how we learn it and everything else, it's gotten a lot more corporate. It's gotten a lot more mm -hmm. um, closed in certain ways. Yeah, You know, I talk to a lot of students who are coming out of recording school. And when I say, record, you know, audio school, let's say. Right. And one of the things that is lacking now is the ability to gain certain skills that we learned on the job. You know, one mm -hmm. of the things that you learned on the job working live shows, I learned on the job working in recording studios was people skills. Yeah. And people yeah. skills, I think, especially are probably, you know, the biggest factor, not only in building your network, but also mm -hmm. in surviving, Yeah. you know, for example, when we talk about, you know, I mean, it's one thing to get the gig. It's another to keep the gig, right? not feel overwhelmed, not feel that you're being walked all over by people. And that has to do with learning those people skills. Yeah. And I think that, you know, that is probably one of the biggest challenges right now for yeah. a lot of younger people coming in is how do you get those skills? <clears throat> yeah. And yeah, they're super hard to... None of the schools are teaching students that, um, at least that I know of. But I think well, that, you know. How do you know, teach that? I mean, it, you, can't, you can't, but there. you, you can try to part there. wisdom, right? Like, yeah, the, there's, yeah. the, there's the, you know, every sound company, ask anybody that's in hiring, they'll say, I can, it's easy. I can teach you how to mix but I can't teach you how to be a nice person. Right. And if you don't have the ability to work as a team and be, you know, a, a nice person with a great attitude, you're not going to get very far because people don't want to work with you. They're not going to refer you gigs. Um, and they're not going to mentor you. Um, because I don't want, I don't want to men waste my time mentoring someone that just has a shitty attitude. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> you know? It's true. And I think that's, I mean, and, and it, there's a difference us? between like having a great attitude and be willing to do whatever it takes and not be taken advantage of. And I think sure. that's it's a really hard line to draw or to know if you're being taken advantage of it's a lot of gray area there there's really a lot is. of gray areas you know especially because as you say i mean if you know if you think about most the trajectory of most of us when we're very new in the industry of course we're going to work our asses off and we're going to do it willingly right. you know and at what point do you you know, and I see this question online all the time, and I'm sure you do too, you know, am I being taken advantage of? Right. You know, and who can really judge that other than you? Yeah, you you have to make that judgment. And, you know, and it, it goes back at the whole, 
should, you know, should I take an unpaid internship or am I being taken advantage of? There's, there's nothing wrong with taking an unpaid internship or volunteering as long as you're learning something and getting something out of it. Mm -hmm. When you're being taken advantage of, yeah, we'll give you a shot for six months and all you're doing is sweeping floors and cleaning up after that's being taken advantage of. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and I would like the industry to create more internship and mentorship opportunities for people. Um, because I mean, we all learned on the job, but someone taught us, right? <laughs> someone was willing to share that knowledge. Someone was willing to go, you know what? You're mixing monitors today and hand it off to me, right? But they were sitting behind me in case I needed right. help, right? They didn't just leave me at the board to think. Um, but it's those so opportunities, right? And it's the, it's the opportunity to build that network. You know, if you're sweeping mm -hmm. floors for six months and you're invisible, for that yeah, entire that, time. that's not an internship. That's, You're the kid who's going to get the sandwiches, you know, and yeah, and that's an internship it. to be a janitor. Yeah, um, yeah. So you know, but yeah, you know, it's such it's such a gray area, and and people will take advantage of people, but there are plenty of people in the industry that are willing to take people on mm -hmm. and help them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's a matter of finding those people. And sometimes it's a lot of times it's not a formal thing. It's you, you showed up and you got paid to do a gig, but then you met someone and they're like, yeah, I, I can't pay you, but come down to the gig I'm doing on Friday and I'll show you more stuff. Right. Or just six months later, they remember you and call you out of the blue yeah. because you yeah. helped them with something, you yeah. know, and, and that comes down to what you're talking about, about just being a nice person, you know, yeah. I mean, being a nice person and they'll remember you, you know, there's always, you know, if you're working or if it's an internship, try to get people's contact information and keep in touch with them. Um, I mean, you'll be able to tell pretty quickly if whether if they return your emails or don't you know yeah yep. but you know and I always tell people you know, people get so stressed out about oh how do I network and this is you know what do I say and I don't want to approach so and so because they're super important right I always tell people I'm like going to work every day is networking yeah because all our industry, it's all project based. You're or you're working with an artist, or the show's done and you're on to the next show, right? It's also relationship based. Yeah. And, you know, so I will remember the four people I worked with on Monday that were great. And then next week I get a call and I'm like, yeah, I want those same four people. Yeah. You know, so that's that's the biggest networking and staying in touch with those people. And I think you put your finger on it, though. It's really it's ultimately about being a nice person and being yeah. helpful. It's, you know, it's the the old quote unquote golden rule, you know, yeah. just treat everybody like you want to, to be treated yourself. Yeah. And, you know, for me, for example, I mean, those are the the people who mentored me. You know, I was grateful to them, but I also you know, I'm conscious of the fact that they mentored me because they felt I was worth mentoring. Right. And I'm going to do the same thing. And I'm sure yep. it's the same for, for you. We're going to do the same thing. You know, if I get two interns that I run into and one of them is a jerk and lazy or, you know, whatever else, not motivated, and the other one wants to go out of their way to do, you know, I mean, I, I have said to people before, you know, I want to hire people who don't come to me and say, what do you want me to do? But come to me and say, hey, should I do this? You know? Right. Right. I mean, and, yeah. and I think that's really, you know, it's, I think yeah. that's what helps you build that network is being. Yep. And, and it, it's seizing, you know, opportunities like, you know, I know people that, you know, are going to audio school and every time that studio is open, for them to use they are the first ones signed up and they're working in the studio and yep. other people are like hmm, don't doesn't matter don't need it yeah 
I don't, uh, you know, so it's true. I mean, that, and that's the thing, you know, I, I actually got myself in trouble because my first studio gig, I was, you know, anytime there was an open room, I was in there, you know, playing around, learning how to splice tape and align machines and all that stuff because I wanted to, you know, right. Yeah. And I think that is, you know, that's, that comes down to the same question, you know, that, that, I mean, for you, you started doing what you did because you were impassioned with it. You know, right. you may not have described it that way, you know, when you were doing it, because back then, as you say, we were all young and we were just doing it because that's what we were doing. Right. But, you know, I mean, you stuck with it because you loved what you were doing. Yeah, for sure. You know, and I think that's, uh, that's really probably the way that I think we can be the most helpful to a lot of the younger people coming in is just to to teach them those skills that, or at least try and teach them those skills right. that the schools can't teach. Yeah. You know, yeah. the people skills basically. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, and then the other thing is the political skills, you know, oh, yeah. you, you need to know when not to say something, <laughs> whether it's true or not. Sometimes you just dip it and move on. Um, yeah. Yeah. And well, it, and you know, it's funny because I, I I did a panel recently with a bunch of producers, and one of the things that we all agreed on is that probably one of the most indispensable skills, more important than anything technical, knowing what mic to use, knowing how to plug in a system, is the skill of psychology. Yeah, you know, just yeah. understanding people and understanding that, especially in the kind of work and especially in live work, you know, you're talking about so much pressure and so much tension that people are under, you know, and to be able to take that and know when to just let it roll out, roll off your back. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's, I mean, people, people get sick and, you know, really do a lot of bad things to themselves because they can't take the stress. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, I, I think, that's probably one of the most helpful things. So um, where do you see things going now? Do you see them getting better? For women and underrepresented? Underrepresented people in general, yeah. Yeah, I hope so. Um, you know, there was a lot of promises made last year during pandemic and in the wake of George Floyd's murder mm -hmm. of we're going to diversify our crews and our teams and hiring. We'll we'll see if those promises are kept. Right. First, we got to see if anybody starts to hire at all. Right? Yeah, we got to get back to hiring. But um, you know, I I'm I'm hopeful. Um, and you know, every day that someone gets an opportunity, then you know that. That makes the work worth it. You Are know? you concerned about the status of smaller, smaller, smaller sound companies and oh, yeah. events? Yeah, I you know, um, I think you know, and there's people that make a little, you know, they're on a different pay scale than me that have to make these decisions and know more than I do, but I'm. I mean, I'm assuming that, you know, major touring on arena and stadium levels, that infrastructure is not broken. They've, um, got, they've got deep pockets. Yeah. And we'll be able to go back to touring in some modified fashion. Um, I think on smaller scale, you know, there's venues that don't exist anymore that, you know, if you're a booking agent, you're like, I'd love to book you into Boulder, but there's no venues anymore. So and there's those are also you know, the places that a lot of people learn. Yeah. You know, that's so, where you, you know, your yeah. So there's venues that don't exist. There's going to be, you know, there's already sound company, you know, sound companies, lighting companies, our vendors have gone under. Mm -hmm. Um, or they've been, you know, in the midst of being consolidated into one large company yeah um and, you know and it so it goes all the way through and then just there's going to be a lack of experienced touring crew 
when yeah. we go back because they've just like, hmm, I got a family, I got mortgage payment, and I took this a job as a my dream job, job. But yeah. I have I have a steady paycheck and I have health insurance. Not going back, right? Yeah. Um. So it's gonna it's it's gonna take a while and it's gonna look different. And, and I think it's gonna be probably a resurgence of the same you know it's like indie labels i mean it's the same kind of concept you know the yeah. the 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 larger venues and the larger operations get corporatized even more you know and then mm-hmm. have to have you know the next generation of rat sound or whomever coming in you know just like a, a new indie label comes in you know and you have yeah. to have people who are brave enough and or young and foolish enough, whatever you want to call it, to, to get in there and do right. it again from that ground level and start that that whole process over yeah. again. Yeah. It's not easy, but uh, you're right. I, I think I have bigger concerns either. about that, about where the industry is going to go, you know, once it does start to recover. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I applaud the stuff that you guys are doing. And, uh, you know, as you know, I, I remain very supportive of that and anything that, uh, that yes, I or any of my colleagues can do. Supporter. Yeah. You know, just, uh, you know where to find me, you know, I'm, I'm happy. Yeah, to be I know where to find you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very happy to be involved mm-hmm. and happy to, to support, you know, your organization and, and all of the other organizations that are really trying to help you know, the, the underrepresented people in our industry. And yes. I think you're doing great yeah. stuff. Soundgirls.org well, for anybody you. who doesn't mm-hmm. know. I'm going to plug it right here. So. Yeah, there you go. Thanks. <laughs> well, Carrie Kais, thank you for being my guest. Oh, well, thank you for inviting me. And maybe we'll have a NAM next year. I don't know. <laughs> maybe. Or something, you know. I mean, right? we got to get out there or sooner. Or something. Later, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I hope so. Hey, I'm Daniel Keller. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and join us each week for Insights and Sound.